Hi, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. I'm Dr. Matthew Levitt, Director of the Reinhardt Program in Counterterrorism and Intelligence, and this is the latest in our Counterterrorism Lecture Series. I'm thrilled to have a fabulous panel, uh, well, fabulous plus me, you'll have to tolerate me too, uh, with Anastasia Smith from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and Aaron Zellin, the Borough Fellow here at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Uh, and today we are going to be talking about Al-Qaeda, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, HTS, and the future of jihadism. And the opportunity to have this discussion is created by the publication of Aaron's new study published by the Washington Institute, uh, the age of political jihadism uh, and the future uh, of Hayat uh, Tahrir uh, al-Sham. So I'd like to start off immediately by handing it over to Anastasia, uh, then we'll go to Aaron. I'll offer some concluding remarks and we'll open to Q&A. We will run the Q&A uh, in two different ways today. If you are on the Zoom, you can ask your questions through the Q&A function. And if you are participating via live stream, you can still ask questions by submitting your questions via an email to the email policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Uh, Anastasia, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. All right, thank you. So I'll start off by providing a uh, overview of Al Qaeda's global network and its future trajectory, and then turn over to Eric to talk about HTS in uh, more detail. Um, so the Al Qaeda enterprise today operates as a global network of affiliates and supporters. Since 9-11, it's evolved from its base in primarily Afghanistan and Pakistan to establish a presence in multiple countries worldwide. During that time, Al-Qaeda shifted away from its centrally directed plotting and devolved operational responsibility to regional affiliates. Uh, because of leadership losses and battlefield setbacks, Al-Qaeda probably will continue to operate as a collection of regionally focused uh, semi-autonomous affiliates that capitalize on local permissive operating environments. Uh, only a small group of legacy leaders remain because CT pressure has degraded its veteran leadership and the organization is relying more on emerging affiliate leaders, including some with less transnational name recognition and shared experiences. Um, so doing a quick rundown, Al-Qaeda and Nir Ayman al-Zawahiri al probably remains in South Asia and we've seen him more frequently in media since August, 2021. A few Al-Qaeda leaders operate from Iran uh, Saif al Adil, the probable deputy emir, and Abd al Rahman al Maghrebi, who continues to lead Al Qaeda's official media. And these senior leaders in Iran collaborate with the leaders of Al Qaeda's affiliates in decision making and oversight. Uh, the leadership cadre across the network's affiliates has mixed experience in ring rec name recognition. Uh, six members of the <laughs> leadership uh, have died in the past two to three years. Uh, so running through them quickly, the current emirs of AQIM and AQAP were known public figures in Al-Qaeda media prior to ascending to their leadership roles. Al-Shabaab's emir has increased his media presence in 2019 when he appeared in a propaganda video for the first time since he became emir in 2014. And then the leaders of Haras al-Din and AQIS appear less frequently, probably to avoid attracting CT pressure. Now this affiliate structure enables Al-Qaeda to weather gains and losses by individual affiliates because it can rely on gains in one region to offset losses in others in order to sustain its reputation and global brand. So as Al-Qaeda currently <coughs> faces some setbacks in the Middle East and has to gauge its ability to operate in Afghanistan over the long term, it can rely on its affiliates elsewhere to conduct attacks and promote the global brand. Um, in particular, the group's affiliates in Africa are growing and have expanded their areas of operation and reach. So starting in Africa, where we are seeing some growth, um, Al-Qaeda has expanded its presence in West Africa since 2017 with the announcement of JNIM. It's expanded operations outside Mali and De Burkina Faso, Niger, and Cote d'Ivoire. And the attack in Togo last month was claimed by JNIM just a few days ago and demonstrates the group's continued efforts to expand its reach and to threaten the coastal countries along the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, in East Africa, Al-Shabaab continues to attack civilian and military targets and is campaigning against the Somali government while also trying to conduct attacks into Kenya. Uh, so moving to the Middle East, where Al-Qaeda is facing setbacks, Al-Qaeda's presence in Syria has struggled 
uh, since the NIFS were front, which was previously considered one of its strongest affiliates, broke from the network and merged with opposition groups to form HTS in 2017. Uh, Haras al-Din, its remaining formal presence, has suffered numerous leadership losses and faced battlefield pressure from HTS. Um, meanwhile, AQAP has been degraded by regional CT efforts and internal spy hunts. Um, this is a contrast to five years ago when AQAP had controlled territory in southern Yemen, including the port of Mukalla, which uh, that achievement uh, could bolster up the perception of al-Qaeda's global network and its strength. Um, amid these regional setbacks, however, though, al-Qaeda al in the Arabian Peninsula has remained intent on targeting Western interests outside of the region. And the Pensacola attack is an example of this. Uh, AQAP members communicated with the Pensacola attacker prior to the attack in December 2019 and later claimed responsibility for the shooting. And then finally in South Asia, um, AQIS was announced in 2014 as its formal presence, um, but it has exhibited little activity beyond media releases. Uh, AQIS is weak and has not publicly claimed an operation since the knife attacks in 2015 and 2016 by its associates in Bangladesh. Um, so Al-Qaeda and AQIS praise the Taliban's return to power and maintain ties to the Taliban regime. Um, thus, they'll probably gauge their ability to operate in Afghanistan under the Taliban regime um, and focus on maintaining safe haven before it seeks to conduct or support external operations. Uh, the group's magazine, One Uma, indicates that Al-Qaeda stopped planning and launching attacks from Afghanistan after the Taliban took over, but notes that attacks against Western interests would continue from other parts of the world. And I believe the quote there was something like, always fresh and flexible as before. And so that kind of brings us back full circle to the point about its structure enabling the group to rely on stronger affiliates to boost its global image while others face setbacks. Um, so what does this mean for the threat? The threat from Al-Qaeda is now primarily in and emanating from regions where its stronger affiliates operate. So that's Yemen, Somalia, and West Africa, as I mentioned. And it'll vary based on local circumstances, including affiliate leadership priorities and battlefield conditions. And then looking forward, um, global terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda are likely to be the largest and uh, most persistent transnational threat. Uh, they benefit from a coherent ideology, uh, strong organizational structures, and the ability to exploit areas of ungoverned or poorly governed territory. Al-Qaeda's future trajectory will depend on its ability to balance leadership's transnational focus with the affiliate's local and regional focus. So the ability of leaders to remain connected fosters group cohesion and promotes Al-Qaeda's global brand. And Al-Qaeda leaders uh, project this global unity by harmonizing uh, messaging and framing many of the affiliates' local efforts under a global narrative. But their transnational focus is what attracts CT pressure, particularly if the affiliates are attacking Western and allied interests. Um, and then Al-Qaeda's affiliates have gained strength by avoiding the CT pressure and maintaining their regional focus. Um, so we're particularly watching for how this plays out in Africa, where Al-Qaeda is already competing with states for territorial control and legitimacy, as well as in Afghanistan, where the group maintains a close relationship with the ruling regime. Uh, if Al-Qaeda attempts at local governments don't succeed, then they may renew their global focus to gain support for their cause. Um, if they do succeed, then we will be contending with terrorists as a political or state actor, um, which will present some challenges. And on that note, I will hand off to Erin to discuss HDS. And she provides a good case study for some of these themes. <laughs> Great, uh, thank you, and thanks for everybody coming online. Um, uh, it's it's definitely an interesting case because, in contrast to say when ISIS broke away from Al Qaeda, they became sort of this competitor with, um, you know, Al Qaeda specifically for global support, whereas HTS has kind of done its own thing and focused more on the local scene than anything. So, one of the things I wanted to note is that. The idea for this paper really uh, first began back in August 2020 when I saw that Abu Muhammad Jalani, the leader of uh, HTS or Hayat Tahir Hashem, 
was out in some restaurant locally within Idlib serving food or a hot meal to residents locally. Um, and I was like, this is quite interesting. I, I couldn't imagine, say, like uh, Osama bin Laden or Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi being out in some restaurant like Afghanistan or Iraq doing this. Um, and then, of course, there's questions about personal security um, and issues related to drones, which obviously have always been important in terms of these guys not really coming out in the first place. Um, so, you know, one of the original ideas for this paper was about sort of critically assessing HTS's transformation and changes. Of course, at the beginning, I was a little bit skeptical just because just because somebody says something doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Um, but as I dug into it more deeply, I realized that uh, there was a reality to it. Then on top of this, um, a little more than a year ago, we saw some reports coming out from people associated with International Crisis Group, as well as ICRC, based off of field work in Idlib, um, as well as meeting Jalani himself, um, and based off of their findings, suggested that if HTS continued to change some of its behaviors, that it was possible that they could potentially be taken off of the terrorism list. Then shortly afterwards, there was an interview on Frontline PBS with Jalani himself. Um, um, and in it, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey, who had at the time during the Trump administration, been the envoy for Syria as well as the fight against ISIS, um, uh, discussed sort of this changing focus sort of in the way the US was perceiving HTS. In the documentary, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey admitted that the U.S. stopped directly targeting Jalani in August 2018, and that there allegedly had been some, at least based off of the way he discussed it, potential back-channeling between him and the group, likely, I would assume, via Turkey, um, where uh, Ambassador Jeffrey said that HTS told them that, quote, we want to be your friend, we're not terrorists, we're just fighting Assad, we're not a threat to you. Um, plus, from Ambassador Jeffrey's point of view, he said he wasn't necessarily against the idea per se. He said, quote, they are the least bad option of various <clears throat> options in Idlib, and Idlib is one of the most important places in Syria, which is one of the most important places right now in the Middle East. So in addition to understanding sort of HTS's transformation internally, I wanted to sort of critically assess this question about engagement and or whether it was plausible that they could eventually become taken off of the terrorism list. I realize I forgot to show the picture of him serving fool to people. <laughs> um, so one of the things I also did in this paper was try and situate what was going on with HTS and ground it in sort of the evolution that we've seen with the jihadi movement historically, as well as more recently in the past decade. I think one of the important um, things that happened that we saw, especially with the onset of the Arab uprisings, sort of the opening of public squares in some countries that were open for a little while, though most of them no longer are, um, as well as the civil wars that happened in a number of countries that there was this growth in Dawa or outreach to locals, um, as well as many governance endeavors that we're seeing in a number of locations in addition to um, Syria itself. This, of course, was a change in many ways to more of the purely terroristic as well as insurgent activities of these groups that we had seen in the decades prior. Um, and based off of my look at HTS as well as the wider scope of the jihadi movement in general, I would argue that this decade, the 2020s, we could be seeing them adding to this repertoire in relation to issues of diplomacy and negotiations. Um, of course, we saw uh, over the last couple of years with the Taliban in Afghanistan successfully negotiate the U.S. Uh, exit from there. Um, and then on a more localized level, we've seen um, JNAM, uh, the group already mentioned, based in Mali in the Sahel region, doing a number of <clears throat> local deals with local actors within the areas that they're operating in and that there's been some you know, rumors that they might also do some negotiations with the central government in Mali as well. This was also alluded to in a relatively recent lecture now given by one of uh, HTS's senior leaders uh, or ideologues, Abdurrahman al-Atun in Idlib in mid-September <laughs> last year, um, analyzing sort of the similarities between HTS as well as Hamas and the Taliban. In part of the lecture, he notes that both have, quote, developed networks with foreign powers to achieve their goals, end quote. And therefore you could see that there's this shift in, in the way that this is happening. Um, one of the reasons why the title or part of the title of this paper is called political jihadism, because one of the things we see is that there's sort of this 
combination in some ways between what we've seen historically from sort of the more mainstream political Islamist groups with what we're seeing with jihadi groups. Um, and therefore, now with HTS, we're seeing this more politically inclined organization than something that's purely theologically forward, but remaining still with some level of extremist belief. Um, as Jalani himself put it in a video released in May 2020, um, where he addressed a number of HTS fighters, he said, quote, some people limit the issue of implementing the rule of the Sharia to just imposing some of the Hadood punishments or the corporal punishments, chopping off hands, stoning whomever, whipping someone who drinks alcohol and so on. But this is a very basic part of the very big concept of implementing the rule of Sharia or Islamic law, end quote. Um, and that way, the way I view it is that Jalani is no longer just a leader of some terrorist group or some insurgent faction, but also the head of, uh, in many ways, an inchoate uh, polity that they're trying to build in Northwest Syria. Um, you could see this in the case of him responding to an invitation by the civilian-led uh, Salvation Government, which is the bureaucratic entity that sort of runs the governance in the areas that HCS controls, talking to the local Shura Council in relation to the high prices of bread during um, uh, the crisis that happened last fall as a consequence of sort of the Turkish lira having issues in relation to the US dollar. Then more recently, earlier this year, in uh, early uh, January 2020, Jalani appeared at the inauguration of a widened road that connects Bab al Hawa to Aleppo explaining that these products are sort of a building block to better life for those uh, living there, where he said, quote, freedom comes from military strength and dignity comes from economic investment projects through which the people and the citizens live a dignified life that befits Muslims, end quote. Within the broader booklet, which is about 90 pages or so, there's a lot of details about HTS's current governance as well as sort of some of the limitations related to it, especially in regards to sort of the human rights abuses that they're still conducting. Um, but due to the limited time of this talk, um, I'll not get into the specifics. So for those interested in a lot more details on the governance apparatus, I would encourage people to read it. When sort of looking at this question of the terrorism designation themselves, I you know dug deep into the actual law related to it, as well as spoke to a number of people within the US government. Um, working on these issues, as well as people that have previously been in government. Um, and, and based off of that, I concluded that while um, sort of the case for HTS to be designated is a lot weaker now than it had been when they're originally part of the Islamic State of Iraq or Al-Qaeda, um, it still meets the legal threshold for the designations, whether it's the case of the assassination of someone like Raid Fares, a hero of the Syrian revolution, um, shooting rockets into civilian areas, um, which admittedly is a lot less now than it had been previously, sometimes shooting at protesters and demonstrators that are trying to gain their rights or are against sort of the program that HTS is trying to pursue. And then there's also the case of when there's been a conflagration between Israel and Hamas in the last year or so, where they sort of backed the terrorism of Hamas, whether it's attacks in, say, Jerusalem or sending rockets into civilian areas in Israel. Um, and in addition to that, um, there's also been the legitimization of the killing of Samuel Pati, the French teacher um, who is trying to teach st students locally in France about sort of freedom of speech in the context of the Charlie Hebdo cartoons. And beforehand, Samuel Pati told anybody that was a Muslim that if they didn't want to be in the classroom, they could leave the classroom. However, as a consequence of what happened, he was beheaded, um, and, and this was legitimized not just by HTS members, but also the Salvation Government put out a statement um, in many ways. Then you had the congratulatory messages about Qurasidin attacks against the Syrian regime, even though HTS themselves were no longer related to Qurasidin um, and actually cracked down upon them. Um, then from sort of a le legacy historical perspective, um, one of the auxiliary media accounts that HTS uses online to promote its brand and uh, content, they still quote audio from somebody like Abdullah Azam, the godfather of the Afghan Jihad in the 1980s, Osama bin Laden, and Abu Yahya al Libi, for example. Um, then there also is the issue <coughs> considering these things is how long do you have to wait until somebody is off of the list, especially when it's a group that's not defunct. Um, 
there's important historical baggage to remember about HTS <laughs> and its predecessor groups when it was Jabhat al-Nusra in particular, in, in relation to the fact that, you know, they helped enable ISIS in the rise coming into Syria in the first place. Then there are a number of campaigns where they're, you know, fighting against Alawi civilians and trying to ethnically cleanse certain areas in Latakia. Then there's also the case directly relevant from a U.S. government perspective where they kidnapped and tortured two American journalists. Thankfully, unlike with ISIS, where many people were killed and executed in a violent manner on video, um, <laughs> both of these uh, guys, they were able to eventually escape or get ransomed home. Um, there is, though, when thinking about this process, a five-year review, review window for the foreign terrorist organization list. Um, and if HTS goes below the threshold um, and remains there for a time, uh, if they do make changes, uh, there are other ways to still sanction them due to their sort of authoritarian governments as well as human rights abuses. For example, one could use, say, Executive Order 13572, the blocking of property of certain persons with respect to human rights abuses in Syria, which was originally signed by former President Barack Obama in uh, late April 2011. Um, according to the Treasury Department, um, uh, the clause related to this would be specific to, quote, any person determined by the Secretary of the Treasury in consultation with the Secretary of State is responsible for or complicit in or responsible for ordering, controlling, or otherwise directing or to have participated in the Commission of Human Rights Abuses in Syria, including those related to repression, end quote. And there are plenty of examples of this. Um, one only needs to look at, say, the prison system that HTS runs, which the UN Human Rights Council has called a crime against humanity. If it got to this point, it would also potentially help uh, relieve efforts related to the humanitarian aid situation in Northwest Syria. And this is relevant when we're now thinking about cross-border aid mechanism that will likely probably be nixed in a month um, as a consequence of Russia's continuing transience on the issue, but also as a consequence of the war between Russia and Ukraine and the U.S.'s support for Ukraine. Plus, even if, say, um, hypothetically, HTS was taken off the FTO list, Treasury could still, um, you know, through um, the specially designated global terrorist authorities, designate specific leaders. Jalani is already designated, for example, but other senior leaders such as Abu Maria al Qahtani, Abu Fatah al Fergali, Mazhar al Wais, Abdurrahim Atun, et cetera, would potentially still be designated. And it would, in some ways, be similar to what we saw when the FARC in Colombia um, was taken off the list, but those that were still involved in some criminal activities would still be uh, designated. If the U.S. was interested in engaging HTS at some point, more for realist reasons than anything related to shared interests, there are a number of things that I think potential conditions at the beginning would be worth considering. One is related to allowing human rights organizations to inspect prison facilities and independently reporting on these findings. Jelani himself said in his interview with Frontline that he would be willing to have this, so I think it would be important to call him on that bluff release political prisoners and provide restitution for any crimes against them, form a truth and reconciliation commission so society can move forward based off of what's happened over the last 10 years, open up the Salvation Government's Shura Council and prime ministerial elections to the entire population and not just an elite cohort and include women in this process, allow the US and other governments to fund civil society and pro-democratic entities in HTS control areas, dissolve HTS and completely subsume its infrastructure into the Salvation Government and use it as sort of a Ministry of Defense instead, which they don't have at this point. Um, and the most high-end ask, obviously, would be is potentially for HTS historical leadership should voluntarily resign, serve prison terms for past crimes in, say, Turkey, and then retire once their terms have been served, um, as was the case with some members of the Cali cartel back in the 1990s in Colombia. So the trend seen in HTS is change, uh, changes to a more politically focused jihadi group than sort, sort of a theologically focused one is worth understanding since similar dynamics could play out elsewhere in relation to the jihadi movement. Of course, each context and group is different and therefore detailed understandings of those dynamics and depending on which group one might be focused on. 
Nevertheless, um, jihadi groups uh, focusing more on diplomacy and negotiation on top of their more known insurgent, terrorist, and local governance activities illustrates a more complicated way adversarial governments and actors will have to deal with them when they're trying to isolate, deter, and or defeat these groups. It's likely that issues presented in this booklet um, related to HGS will increasingly become bigger policy dilemmas that Washington will have to deal with going forward in relation to some groups. Um, having a policy to potentially deal with these vexing and likely uncomfortable issues um, is a worth uh, thinking through, even if in the end the U.S. and other governments decide on uh, continuing to have a sort of wholly securitized approach to some of these groups, even if there have been changes at the edges. This is in part not only due to jihadi groups gaining strength in many locations as local governments weaken, but also because Washington's greater focus uh, policy-wise on power competition with countries like Russia and China. Any potential changes would be transactional at best though, if, if these jihadi groups, if it even got to that point. Um, Washington will have to calculate from its perspective the costs or benefits and whether it makes sense to change its current policy course with HTS. Whatever the U.S. government decides in the end, at the very least, viewing Jelani and HTS through the AQ prism is factually incorrect and will lead to incorrect assessments of the group going forward, which could potentially create other issues in the future due to a flawed understanding of the group's nature, however extreme and authoritarian HTS continues to be. In particular, I'm thinking about this in the context of for how many years the U.S. government still viewed ISIS through the lens of AQ, which caught many by surprise with when, what occurred sort of in the 2012 to 2014 time period, and we wouldn't want to repeat any of those types of mistakes. Um, therefore, it's important to understand the current reality of HTS. So thank you for everybody for watching online. So um, Anastasia, Aaron, thank you so much for that. Um, a couple of, of thoughts and then we'll, we'll, we'll go straight to the Q&A. Some questions have already started coming in on the Q&A function of Zoom and, and on the email again, that email is policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Look, it's, it's a very, very timely opportunity to have a conversation about Al-Qaeda, HTS and the future of jihadism for several reasons. <clears throat> in, its, uh, in the US intelligence community's latest worldwide threat assessment, <clears throat> The IC makes clear that uh, while the Islamic State itself has been defeated, uh, ISIS as an organization still aspires to rebuild the caliphate and to carry out attacks primarily in Iraq and Syria and to re, uh, uh, re reassert itself in Afghanistan with, with um, aspirations to do more uh, around the world and potentially through inspiration do things even in the near term. But the fact is that in a post-Islamic state as a governing entity era, uh, in the wake of the territorial defeat of the Islamic State. And given the rise of jihadi groups that used to be tied to Al-Qaeda, but are not quite so clearly anymore, in particular HTS, and given the withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, now is a very opportune time to have this conversation uh, and to figure out where we put a group like HTS in the spectrum of transnational jihadi threats is HTS no longer a threat simply because it is no longer quite so clearly part and parcel uh, of Al-Qaeda. <clears throat> and I think we need to put this into a slightly larger context, part of which has to do with how we assess the international threat. And an even more important part has to do with how our, the US government's change of in its 20 year counterterrorism posture uh, affects our ability to keep a pace with the changing nature of this threat. Um, I think one thing we need to come to terms with, and Anastasia opened with this, um, is that Al-Qaeda in particular <clears throat> is operating more through affiliates and supporters than it ever was. And I would argue it has been since at least 2002. There's a debate now between scholars and academics as more of us have an opportunity to look at and assess some of the bin Laden papers that were seized in the Abbottabad raid and to uh, uh, debate and discuss to what extent the lack of information in those papers about the Madrid attacks or the London attacks or others suggest that those were, were or were not <clears throat> core Al-Qaeda attacks. From where I sit, they were absolutely core Al-Qaeda attacks. And there's plenty of evidence for that, even if they're not discussed by bin Laden in his papers being run by Rashid Raouf and others in Pakistan at the time. The fact that today Al Qaeda is being presenting itself more as a threat through its affiliates to me does not make the threat of Al Qaeda 
any less significant. In some ways, it makes it more so. The geographic um, spread, the uh, dispersion of this threat makes it, in some ways, more difficult uh, for us to contend with. The second point is that uh, we have a real problem in what I would call safe havens, but maybe is better described as I think Anastasia put it as dealing with ungoverned or maybe more even more importantly, undergoverned or poorly governed spaces. Uh, many people are, are grabbing onto the issue of Afghanistan uh, as, as they should. And the latest UN report on uh, the Taliban and Al Qaeda in Afghanistan is quite telling. Uh, the release of senior Al Qaeda officials from jails <clears throat> the potential, according to the reporting of some member states, of um, Al Qaeda personnel living in former diplomatic compounds and having regular access to senior Taliban leadership, the fact that Haqqani is controlling key parts of the Taliban government, all of those uh, raise significant questions and areas of concern in terms of Al Qaeda's ability to uh, reestablish itself and establish safe haven in Afghanistan. But as you heard about uh, the concerns of JNIM and other elements of Al Qaeda and transnational jihadist groups in Africa, these concerns are not, not only limited to the problem of Afghanistan. I think the bigger issue, frankly, is what the change in the US counterterrorism posture means for our ability to keep abreast of these quickly changing threats. <clears throat> and let's be blunt, the change in the US counterterrorism posture from what we've done to 20 years to what we're trying to do now, I think is long overdue but also is a tectonic change, which is likely going to leave some gaps. The idea of moving from a US-led partner-enabled model to one that is largely, in terms of international terrorism abroad, that is not immediately targeting the US homeland or targeting Americans abroad, is partner-led and US-enabled, must make us at least consider the possibility that we're not gonna have our finger to the pulse, our ear to the ground, quite the way we used to, and may not be able to pick up on quickly changing trends. And in fact, even over the past 20 years, when it was a US-led and partner-enabled international posture, we missed some of those things. <clears throat> the US government was referring to AQAP as a simply regional and local threat until there was an underwear bomber. And we famously referred to uh, ISIS as the JV of terrorist groups until it took over a parcel of territory the size of Great Britain. The fact that we are not going to have as significant an international presence doesn't mean that we can't counter terrorism, but it means we have to take account of the ways in which the um, ability to have sources, run sources, have drones running as regularly as we used to, and the types of intelligence inputs that we have become accustomed to and reliant upon over the past 20 years are not always going to be there. And the idea of doing counterterrorism over the horizon is a great, you know, little soundbite, but it's not much more than that. Counterterrorism really can't be done over the horizon. And so I think that the final thing we need to think about when we're looking at this is understanding that one, one part of this change counterterrorism posture is a de facto recognition. <clears throat> that for 20 years, we did tactical counterterrorism, finding, fixing, and finishing really well. But strategic counterterrorism, getting ahead of the radicalization curve, there we were largely, well, we failed. Uh, there are about 20 times as many people on the US's, U.S. government's various terrorism lists today as there were in 9-11. There are far more people radicalized to the point of violence today than there were at 9-11, which to me means we need a significant rebalancing in how we do things, and in particular, how we fund things between kind of hardcore tactical counterterrorism and preventing encountering violent extremism, trying to get ahead of the curve. That means we're gonna to continue to need analysts and operatives and agents to fight the terrorist threat as, is, as it is today. And we're going to need to invest far more in uh, social workers and uh, clinicians, uh, people who are working in local communities in the United States and abroad, by the way, on the jihadist threat and on other ideological threats, domestic, white supremacist, far right, far left as well, if we're going to get ahead of this problem set. Our balancing 
of the strictly counterterrorism and the preventing and countering violent extremism has not been where it needs to be. The whole, this whole conversation gives us an opportunity to think about all of these things from the very tactical, how do we deal with HTS on the ground today, to the much, much broader, how do we uh, resource our CT and CVE efforts. And I'm really thrilled to have Anastasia and Aaron uh, with us today to be able to have that conversation. <clears throat> so I'm gonna take the speaker slash moderator's prerogative uh, to ask one quick question to the, each of you. And then we've already got uh, some questions that have come in uh, through the Q&A and through the email. And again, if you have a question and you're watching uh, via the live stream, you can send that question into the email policy forum at Washington Institute. Org. So ultimately, how do we, from a counterterrorism perspective, how do we deal with, how do we change the way we're dealing with groups that are still extreme, espouse very jihadist ideologies, uh, but are beginning to govern, are trying to establish relationships with other governments in the region, Ultimately, what I'm talking about are Sunni jihadist groups that are trying to take on a Hamas or Hezbollah model. How complicated is it gonna be for us to deal, for example, with HTS as it becomes less clearly Al-Qaeda, maintains a jihadist identity, but also is serving fool to people and is trying to reach out to local governments. Anastasia, let's start with you and then we'll, we'll go to Aaron. Um. It's going to be a challenge moving forward. And I'll put that one over to you. No, I, I agree it's a challenge, but I think one of the things to think about in the context of if we frame it as sort of similar to what we've seen with Hezbollah and Hamas in the past is that in the cases of Hezbollah and Hamas, they've been attached to major American adversaries like Iran and their threat network. Whereas with a group like HTS or the Taliban, uh, both very problematic. But, you know, in the case of the Taliban, you know, there's the history of them working with Pakistan, an American ally. And then in the case of HTS, you know, whether it's stated publicly or not, you know, there's a lot going on behind the scenes, whether it's potentially with Qatar or Turkey. Those are both American allies, too. So it creates potential opportunities that could be a lot more positive than anything that could ever happen with say Hezbollah and Hamas, which will be no matter what adversarial with the United States. That being said, um, due to their ideological proclivities, there will still be certain red lines that just will not be able to cross, whether it's them backing terrorism that say happens between Israelis and Hamas, just because they're seen as you know, a resistance group, even if ideologically there are differences between Hamas and HDS. Or in the case of what we saw as I alluded to in France with the you know, alleged case of blasphemy, for them, that's important for them. And, and we've seen this more recently in the news with some comments in India, which has inflamed not just you know, groups like HDS, but um, governments in the Arab world too, like Qatar. Um, so it's a very complicated thing. And that's why I think for now, a wait and see approach is important more than anything because you know, it's still very new in many ways, what we've seen with HTS, of course, it's been five or six years, but what happens, let's say uh, the Assad regime, Russia, Iran, decide to actually start retaking HTS's territory again, um, and Turkey doesn't do anything about it for whatever reason, or they just decide it's worthwhile to actually go after Turkey's drones. What happens then if HTS loses territory in four or five years? What will they become then? Will they revert back to how they were before? So there's a lot of you know, structural questions that remain. And I think for now, that's why the status quo is in some ways relevant to think about just because it is so complicated. It's better to wait and see than to act and then potentially make a mistake that would be regretted down the line. Plus, if you look at it from you know, within the US government based off of conversations I've had, it's not really something that's strategically important for the government right now. There's a lot bigger issues. Obviously, everything going on with Russia and Ukraine, and then, you know, whatever's happening with China and the Pacific um, are, are first. And then if you look, if you're just looking at the terrorism related issues, of course, problems like ISIS and Al Qaeda will be top of the line first. And therefore, 
the problem set of HTS is much lower. And especially if they're not trying to do attacks in the West or do anything against the US, then it's kind of like, okay, so how is this relevant in some ways in terms of dealing with them on this issue? So I think it's, it's, it's complicated in that way. So that was not a particularly fair question for Anastasia, who's a current I, U.S. government official. <laughs> so, so yeah, me... I can have another answer <laughs> to talk, kind of talk about. I was thinking that you know terrorist groups are exploiting weak governance, social fragmentation, capitalizing on local grievances, and providing some of services um, and security in areas to you know push their ideology, gain power. Um, and looking at some of the drivers of that and addressing those um, is one way to look at the, or kind of address that issue. So looking at regional and interstate conflicts, demographic pressures, environmental degradation, and democratic re retrenchment are ways to, yeah, <laughs> Super. things we need to look at when we address the issue. Excellent. Yeah, so. I want to jump to some of the questions that have come in. We've got a few already. Uh, again, policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org is the email address if you want to email in a question. First question is from Jeff Selden from VOA. Uh, thanks for doing this. Given the relatively uh, weakness, the relative weakness of Al Qaeda core and especially AQIS, uh, Al Qaeda in the um, Indian subcontinent, might the elements currently in Afghanistan eventually be absorbed by the Taliban? And to what extent do Al Qaeda affiliates effectively control and govern territory in Africa? Is there any chance? any will declare themselves to be separate countries or entities or even a caliphate in Africa. Anastasia, do you want to take either part of that first? Um, so I can take the first part, you should repeat it really quickly. Yeah, uh, given the relatively <clears throat> weakness of Al-Qaeda core and AQIS, might the elements currently in Afghanistan eventually be absorbed by the Taliban? I mean, that's certainly something that we're, we're watching for. Um, Al-Qaeda is definitely gauging its ability to operate under Taliban restrictions. It really wants to maintain that safe haven um, and is going to prioritize that over uh, conducting or seeking to conduct external operations and um, maintaining ties to the Taliban regime is uh, important to agree. <laughs> In terms of the Africa question, I would say that um, JNM, which is the AQ branch in the Mali region, the Sahel in general, I wouldn't say that they're overtly controlling or governing territory now, but it, you could see in some you know, villages and areas that there's sort of shadow governance going on in the same way that we maybe thought about how the Taliban was operating prior to their takeover of the country in Afghanistan. So if say the Malayan government completely collapsed, it probably wouldn't take that much time or steps for JNM to potentially take over and then, you know, control things more overtly at this juncture, at least. I did notice, uh, kind of jumped out at me in the UN's latest report on the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, <clears throat> they highlighted um, Al-Qaeda statement from February earlier this year, talking about a desire to carry out external plots, but phrasing it in such a way as to imply pretty clearly, and maybe more than imply, that they would do this not based out of Afghanistan, that they would do it from elsewhere, even as they tried to, you know, establish themselves more formally in Afghanistan, and as if that would create a, a, a sufficient delta for us in terms of where we responded, which I, I think was a maybe a little bit of a, a misconception on their part. <clears throat> the next question comes from Charles Lister at MEI. HTS's designation status is rightly viewed through a counterterrorism lens, but the group has changed and there's no prospect of it leaving the scene in Northwest Syria either. Our counterterrorism lens on this issue places severe limitations on our ability to provide aid and stabilization assistance to the millions living in the area, which arguably aids HTS more than anyone else. Is there a way to better square those circles? Aaron, that is definitely for you. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough question, and, and thanks for it, Charles. Um, in the near term, I don't think it's possible. Um, if you talk to people in the U.S. government in many ways, the issue of the terrorism list is kind of a mute subject. So um, I'm unsure if 
debating at this point is really that relevant to the reality of how the U.S. government's trying to do its policy vis-a-vis -vis Northwest Syria, um, uh, with HTS specifically, or Syria in general. Um, and therefore, there needs to be other potential solutions um, that people might not like, but will likely enable HTS to continue to control and consolidate the area, whether it's Turkey working more closely with HTS to stabilize the region and help them develop the economy in a more mature and balanced manner. Um, uh, and therefore, this will in many ways consolidate their control as the rulers. Um, I don't know if there's any good answers at this point uh, because of the situation that it's led to. If HDS continues to change, um, it's plausible that a broader conversation could open up that could you know, change that policies from the US government perspective. Um, but based off of a lot of structural issues related to this and the way that the US government looks at it, I, I think right now at least, it's, there probably isn't a way to square the circle, unfortunately. Um, the next question uh, follows up nicely on this one. A lot of attention has been placed on the divergence in policy between Turkey and the United States regarding the SDF. But what about Turkey and HTS? What do you see in store for the terrorism designation on HTS and Turkey's overall relationship with the group in Idlib? Well, I think it's important to note that Turkey does designate HTS as a terrorist organization too. Um, so at least on a policy level, they have that as well. Um, of course, it becomes a bit more complicated in the fact that part of the reason why the Salvation Government was created as sort of this civilian bureaucratic administration to run the territories was a way to, in some ways, get around these issues, whether it's related to humanitarian aid um, or just assistance in general going through the border crossings. Um, you know, the fact that um, from a U.S. government perspective, HTS isn't necessarily perceived as like this immediate threat. As I noted, Ambassador Jeffrey said, at least during the Trump administration, that they no longer were targeting uh, Jelani and HTS. And my understanding is that that's still sort of the policy by the current administration with Biden, um, is that because of that, it provides the opportunity to sort of for Turkey to kind of do as they please vis-a-vis HTS or Idlib and kind of just look the other way. So even if, uh, you know, HTS is probably seen as problematic on some level still to many people, it doesn't hit sort of this red line where it's this acute problem and therefore it provides the space for Turkey to do things even if it's not the official policy of the Turkish government since HTS is designated by Turkey still. How important is Ayman al-Zawahiri and Al-Qaeda core? If you look through the uh, DNI's worldwide threat statement, if you look through uh, the UN's latest Taliban al-Qaeda statement, <clears throat> there's a lot of hinting that um, Al-Qaeda core is not what it used to be. The UN report based on member states' um, information is that we're talking about a few dozen individuals total in Al-Qaeda core. Um, there's a lot of suggestion that Amin al-Zawahiri is not just the old boring guy who is still issuing very, very, very long and extremely boring statements that no one's paying attention to, but that Al-Qaeda core itself is not just that it's devolved to uh, operationally to its regional affiliates, but that as a core, it's just not as important. And I wonder, I wonder what you think about that, and, and by an extension, are we overplaying our concern about Al Qaeda's ability to uh, reassert itself in Afghanistan if the elements of Al Qaeda that are in Afghanistan, primarily Al Qaeda core and AQIS, are not once what they once were? So <clears throat> we've seen Al Qaeda's leadership uh, transition from that core to more of a um, collaborative approach that includes Iran, uh, Al Qaeda leaders in Iran and the Al Qaeda affiliate leaders and they're collaborating and working together. 
And um, I think uh, one key is that those Al Qaeda leaders um, are what really help to project that global unity, particularly through media, by harmonizing the messaging, um, framing affiliates' local efforts and attacks under global narratives, and pushing out the media and propaganda to boost the group's image, garner recruit, recruits, and um, portray itself as that vanguard of the, the global jihad. Aaron, when you try and kind of weigh Afghanistan and Syria, you know, Jalani and Zawahiri, I mean, where is the fulcrum of what used to be Al-Qaeda, transnational Sunni jihadism today? Well, I think we need to sort of shift the way we frame the issue. I know that for many years we talked about Al-Qaeda core, and because many of the historical leaders were based in the AFPAC region, that was sort of the focus. But with the onset of the drone campaign in 2007, 8, 9, 10, et cetera, which started to kill many of the leaders, you sort of saw that Al-Qaeda diversified the senior leadership. And, and that's why I think it's important to talk more about Al-Qaeda senior leadership than Al-Qaeda core nowadays. Um, you know, if you go back earlier last decade, you saw that somebody like Nasr al waheshi who had been the leader of AQAP, actually became, say, the deputy of Ayman al-Zawahri. And somebody like uh, the head of AQIM before he was killed, Drupdel, he was in the top three or four within Al-Qaeda senior leadership. And therefore, it wasn't just this core that was based in the AFPAC, but the senior leadership was now sort of this diverse spread over many different branches uh, geographically. And, and I think that that's how it continues to be nowadays. Um, if you look at sort of the strongest entities within Al-Qaeda's broader network and branch system, you would say that JNM in Mali and Asahal, as well as Shabab in Somalia are probably the strongest branches nowadays. Of course, if you do like power rankings over time, this changes. I mean, uh, like uh, was mentioned earlier, you know, AQAP and Jabhat al Nusra were seen as like the strongest Al Qaeda branches five to ten years ago, whereas now it's just not the case at all. So I think the key is to continue to see how things evolve. But the idea of an Al Qaeda core, I think, is sort of an anachronism at this point, and that we should be thinking more about Al Qaeda senior leadership because you do have somebody like Zawahiri who is based in AFPAC still allegedly. And then you have senior leaders in Iran, and then you have senior leaders of different branches, Yemen, Somalia, Mali, who are part of the overall senior leadership of the group in that you can't take away sort of the connections between the senior leadership and the branches. It's all together in many ways, which I think people miss. The DNI statement, um, one thing that came out clear was that while Qaeda still wants to carry out attacks targeting U.S. interests, it's, it's a little bit less capable of doing so, and it's it's most capable of doing so abroad, and in particular in areas where it has its strongest affiliates: Yemen, Somalia, uh, West Africa. Um, I'm wondering if you could take a minute to tell us whether Al Shabaab in this in this milieu. So yeah, I mean, Al-Shabaab is, is one of the strongest affiliates uh, right now and largest affiliates. Um, it's generally been more focused on attacking the Somali government um, and US and other Western interests in the region. Um, as you know, we've mentioned, most of the affiliates have been regionally focused um, given its uh, current strength and capabilities and, and wealth uh, and that collaboration of global leaders, there is that potential for you know, Al-Shabaab to conduct something more external um, and benefit uh, or use those capabilities um, kind of as some of the other affiliates are not able to provide that you know, base for planning as we're seeing in Afghanistan. Which leads me to ask about elements within some of these groups that are more extreme. So, for example, <clears throat> Shabab very regionally focused, but did send someone to go for training to carry out a 9-11 style aviation attack. Mm -hmm. um, 
At one point, we were talking about something called the Harasan group. We talked about Harasadeen. Uh, Aaron, maybe you could address a little bit where is Harasadeen and all of this in, in Syria? Um, and maybe Anastasia, you could speak to our, to what extent are we really worried that some of these more regionally focused groups, we might wake up one day and find that there's another plot like that aviation plot coming from a group that is otherwise regionally focused. So Aaron, let's start with you on Horace Dean and come to Anastasia. Yeah, I think one of the interesting <clears throat> developments over the last decade is that if you looked at the case of Syria, you know, when things were first starting in relation to the Syrian civil war, you'd have said that, you know, Al Qaeda was gaining so much strength um, and, you know, gaining the rewards in many ways of years of evolution in the aftermath of sort of the disasters of the Iraq war from their perspective. Um, but today you could say that Al Qaeda lost Syria in many ways, whether it was first to ISIS breaking away, um, but then also with HTS. And as a consequence, they had to create a new branch called Hura Sadin um, a couple of years ago now. But because Hura Sadin was trying to challenge the monopoly of HTS, HTS actually more or less crushed their ability to operate in Northwest Syria in June 2020. Um, of course, Hura Sadin has done a couple of attacks since within Syria itself, one in Raqqa and one in Damascus. But otherwise, in the past two years, they really haven't been all that active. Um, due to the restraints that HTS has put onto them, or just the conditions being uh, difficult for them to operate in elsewhere in Syria. And therefore, while there are still some people involved in Hura Sadin, it's no longer sort of the threat you would think of when sort of the proto entity of it, the Khurasan group, which was sort of this external operations entity within Jabal Tanusra at the time, was trying to do attacks in the West. But because of that, many of those leaders that had been sent from the AFPAC region, from Iran, from Yemen, et cetera, were killed in drone strikes by the US in the 2014 to 16 timeframe. And the potential for these regionally focused groups to be able to turn around on, on some Tuesday and do something really dangerous that's more international? Um, yeah, I mean, you raise a great challenge with this more diffuse threat emanating from more places. There's more to watch than around 9-11 when it was more focused from that AFPAC region. Um, our you know, CT pressure has inhibited these groups' ability to you know, direct, organize, um, and support attack plots. But you know, AQ's affiliates still possess some capabilities and resources that could advance operations, and terrorists are always looking for ways to uh, circumvent our security. Uh, you know, I mentioned the Pensacola attack earlier. That's an example um, of an attack, you know, facilitated by AQAP. Um, it highlights terrorist resilience, the enduring threat, um, and challenges posed by new communications technologies and terrorists' adaptations and continually evolving to our CT measures. So one last question for each of you. This has been a really fantastic session. Um, Anastasia, what conclusions, if any, should we draw from the fact that we've been finding ISIS leaders in HTS territory? Um, and Aaron, <clears throat> one more question has come in. Uh, considering the detriment closing bubble Hawa aid crossing would have on aid coming into Syria, and nothing other than giving a corrupt Assad regime monopoly over aid, which they're monetizing, what do you have to say that the U.S. should consider in terms of Northwest Syria, HTS, and the bubble Hawa aid crossing if it weren't a sealed deal? So let's start with you, Aaron. Okay. Is there anything that can be done? Well, I think it's important to note that even if the aid mechanism is nixed, um, it's likely that aid will still come through the border, it just most likely will come via Turkey only or anybody that might be allied with Turkey. It just won't be going through the UN. There's a special mechanism because usually when the UN provides aid, it's done through the internationally recognized government, but as a consequence of the problematic uh, <laughs> nature of the Assad regime and the fact that you know, the regime has killed so many civilians and harmed many of these people in Northwest Syria in relation to um, the humanitarian situation. That's why this mechanism was created in the first place back in 2014. 
Um, so there still would be aid going through. It just would be on a far more limited basis and would not have the same level of international backing, I guess you could say. Um, therefore, you know, I, I wrote this short piece sort of uh, questioning whether it would be plausible for HTS to build up their own local economy in relation to Turkey. Um, but it is easier said than done. Um, there's a lot put out by Jalani in the last two years talking about, you know, self-sufficiency and not relying on outside aid because then you just become reliant on it and therefore you're not actually building anything in the long term. But there's sort of this gap between his rhetoric and the reality where on the ground, the reality is that HTS has monopolized many different industries locally and, and therefore that creates problems. Ideally, um, even if you know, it's not something the U.S. would prefer to do because it would embolden HDS in many ways, but it, it would help stabilize the population. It's important to note that about three-fourths of the population in that area are IDPs. Um, Internally would, displaced. Persons. Yes. Um, would be for Turkey to help sort of teach or guide HDS relation to the economy based off of their own experiences, sort of combining their Islamist ideas with capitalism if possible. Brings us back to Jim Jeffries' assessment that you know there's least uh, the least bad option in a, in a in a basket of bad options. Yeah, exactly. Anastasia. All right, and then this highlights the fluid nature of these groups operating in common territory, either tolerating each other or working together regionally. To me, it just underscores that you know, as much as HTS is not Al Qaeda anymore, it's still something that is not part of the solution. And there's a reason maybe that senior ISIS leaders feel comfortable hanging out in their midst, which again underscores Jim Jeffries' assessment that we have a whole bunch of not good options. <laughs> this, however, was a really wonderful conversation. And I'm really grateful both to Aaron and Anastasia for uh, making tools available to have, uh, to take the time to, to do this event. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all for attending. Uh, a few of you here in person, on Zoom, online. Uh, watch this space for the Rapporteur Summary that we'll be following shortly. Thank you all and have a great day.